Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. The State Department of Natural Resources and local doctors urge you and your family to take precautions during our extreme hot days and warn about water safety in the wake of several child drownings and boating deaths this summer. Here is Dr. Rob Anderson with the Urgency Room. It's been a beautiful summer. I think people are just so excited to be outside and to be able to be around people, have picnics again. It's been great. Um, we've been seeing a lot of injuries coming uh, into the urgency rooms from just being outside so much. You know, kids running around, spraining their ankles or even breaking their ankle. You know, just being outside, running around, playing, having fun. I've certainly seen a lot of people actually come in with some really bad sunburn. So, you know, it's just a, a great reminder to me, um, you know, especially, you know, for, for younger kids who may not be as cognizant of it, just to make sure you're putting sunscreen on them. I had somebody come in the day and, oh my goodness, they're just head to toe red. Um, mm -hmm. They had been out on the beach, they've been, you know, sun tanning and they put on some sunscreen, but they actually fell asleep out there um, and were out there for a couple hours and boy, they're just head to toe red and, you know, fortunately it wasn't too bad. They weren't blistering at all, but, you know, we, we can even see that sometimes a sunburn and it just gets so severe. Um, and of course, with that, if you're going to be out in this hot sun, you fall asleep, you're getting sunburned, you're not drinking enough water. We've seen a lot of people come in just, you know, super dehydrated. Um, their heart rate's going so fast. Um, so at the urgency room in Egan, Vadness, and Woodbury, uh, where I work, we can start an IV. We can give people IV fluids to help them feel better. Um, so we can give them, you know, some pain medicines if the if the burn is that significant, that bad, or if they're if they're that dehydrated and they just get so sick, they're nauseous and throwing up. And you know, we've even seen a few people with heat stroke. You know, when we get these really hot summer days, especially people who are out, you know, working, um, you know, or the young, the old, if they're not drinking enough water, it can actually raise your core body temperature, you know, and once you start to have mental status changes. So if you get confused, you don't know where you are, who you're with, I mean, that's a, that's a clear sign of heat stroke. And um, absolutely, if, if you're having anything like that, you need to be seen right away, you know, call down and one, go to the emergency department or feel safe that you can drive or have somebody drive you, you know, come to see one of us and at the urgency room and you know, we can certainly help bring down your, your core body temperature if it's that high and give IV fluids and give med medicine to help control the nausea that sometimes comes with that and the vomiting. Um, but we've certainly seen a lot of that this summer. I was gonna ask you what were some of those symptoms that you would see and I think you mentioned a, a majority of them already. Anything mm -hmm. else that people should watch out for? Um, or especially like maybe for their, their kids or something, mm -hmm. you know, what yeah. should be those signs and symptoms that their kids have been, have too much sun or, or they're yeah. dehydrated and not enough water. And yeah. Just, just look at your kid. You know, if, if your child or your grandchild is, you know, outside playing and they're just running around and having fun. And then all of a sudden you look outside and you see the other kids are kind of running around, they're, they're playing and having fun. And maybe one of the, the kids isn't drinking enough water and they're just, acting a little bit more lethargic, a little bit more tired, and they aren't acting their normal self, make sure you go out and see if that kid's doing okay and give them some water to drink. But if maybe they've been thrown up and they're just so dehydrated that they, they need to be seen, you know, oftentimes we can rehydrate these kids with oral fluids, you know, whether that be a, a Pedialyte type of product, you know, or something with electrolytes, so to speak, in it, or just, you know, good old IV fluids as well, but uh, or oral fluids. And sometimes if it's really bad, IV fluids as well, but, you know, look at your kids if, if they aren't acting right or if they're looking just super red if they if a child is crying and they're not making tears if you look in their mouth and it just looks super dry I and mean, that's a sign that the the child could be too dehydrated you know even before summer officially started it's shocking the number of drownings that mm -hmm. we have seen mm -hmm. as well as boating accidents what do you think that they're saying it's like um the most we've seen in, in a decade in yeah. some of the cases any really idea sad. why? Is it because we've all been indoors and now we're like yeah. going out and not being taking some of the precautions yeah. and things? Or? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a component of it. Maybe the summer of 2020, people weren't outside as much and on the water as much and kind of forgot some of those um, you know, routine, should be routine, normal, good habits of, you know, little kids wearing a life jacket or some type of flotation device, you know, if they're gonna be at or near water. We've heard a lot of these tragic stories. I, I just heard one the other day of a, um, a two-year-old had unlocked a, a locked door and didn't know better. And the 11-month-old crawled outside into the pool and ended up drowning. Um, this is something that happened several years ago, but it is just 
such a sad story to hear um, and a, a good reminder, you know, just for, for that water safety and pool safety. You know, a lot of people do have pools um, and we only get to use them for a couple months here in Minnesota and we're always excited to do so, but um, goodness, it's so important to just keep that pool covered if you're not out there. And if the kids are out there playing, always make sure that there's an adult out there, you know, supervising the children, that the young kids are, you know, have some type of life jacket or some good flotation uh, device on them so that they, they don't have that risk of drowning if you turn your back for a second, because it can happen in just a, a moment's notice. You know, I've been at some of the area lakes and on the St. Croix River and at some local uh, swimming pools, but I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people not wearing life jackets and, yeah. and things like that. And it's, I mean, it can happen so quickly and so silently, yeah. these yeah. drownings and accidents yeah. and stuff. Um, what about um, flotation devices? I think people might get a, a, a false sense of security when they're on one of those. They drift out or yeah. it tipped over or something like that yeah. again. Yeah, especially if somebody... If somebody's on a river and doing that, I mean, the rivers just have such incredible currents in some places, you know, so they might be on a small little inner tube and think that they're safe because they're on a flotation device and then all of a sudden they get caught up in some type of current that just pulls them down the river. Um, so yeah, those are, they can be great, but they can also provide that false sense of security. And um, so I certainly advise people to use caution. And, you know, another thing that should probably be addressed too is oftentimes people are drinking, right? If they're gonna be out on, on the water on a boat, you know, I just remember, please drink in moderation or maybe just don't drink at all when you're when you're on the water. It's not worth the risk. Good advice, Sarah. And, and also, um, I've noticing too, when I've been by some of these lakes, there's signs, no lifeguards uh, mm -hmm. on duty and things like that. And maybe that's cutbacks on jobs or something, but mm -hmm. another thing to be people, to be aware of, even if yeah. it's uh, a designated swimming area. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if there's not a life lifeguard out there, you know, and you and you have little kids, you know, as a parent, you know, or, or grandparent or, you know, babysitter or nanny, I mean, you got to be out there watching the kids constantly, you know, put the phone away. Don't be distracted by social media or, you know, sorry, watching the news or reading the news, um, but put it away so you can be, you know, watching the kids uh, on a regular basis. Um, you know, the other thing that I've actually seen recently, too, is uh, people out in the water just playing and stepping on a rock. Um, or I had somebody come in the other day, they're trying to reposition a dock um, and they actually cut their foot pretty bad. Um, so they came into our, our facility um, in Egan and we were able to clean up that wound really well and, and put some good stitches in. But um, keep in mind that if you get a, a cut, a laceration on the foot in fresh water, there are actually some particular bacteria that you may be more pre predisposed to getting. Um, so it's really important to get that um, cut washed out well if you do get one um, underwater and then just be mindful of watching it. And um, sometimes we put people on antibiotics to prevent infection if it's a significant one or at least just be mindful of it if, you know, if we don't, which is what most people don't need an antibiotic. But if you start to develop an infection after stitches have been placed, if it is a fresh water um, cut. So that's another thing that we've actually been seeing a fair amount of here recently. Any final advice for our viewers on how to keep themselves and their, their families safe around, and especially around water? Yeah, well, enjoy the water. I mean, it helps cool us down. It can help prevent heat stroke by, you know, staying cool uh, in the water. So certainly enjoy it. You know, watch your little kids. Try to avoid alcohol. And um, certainly if something happens when, you know, you're on the water, if you have a cut or if, um, Maybe you develop some chest pain or, you know, you've been drinking too much, you start throwing up, you get dehydrated. Um, that's what we are here for um, at the urgency room. Um, like I said before, we're, we're in Egan, Woodbury and Badness Heights. We're open from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. And we have the ability to do IV fluids, to do stitches. You know, if you twist the ankle and the bone's broken and it needs reduction, we can um, put those bones back into place and refer you to a really good orthopedic group to do surgery if you need. Uh, but we have the ability to do all that. We're emergency medicine providers and, and that's what we love to do. So enjoy the summer. Um, we are here for you if you need us. Hopefully you don't, um, but if you do, we are here for you. So thanks Jody for this time. It's been great to chat with you again. Always a pleasure to have you on Inside Healthcare. Glad to see you, Dr. Rob Anderson. Thank you. Thank you.
scientists say that climate change is driving extreme floods, wildfires, and heat. And we could certainly see and feel the effects of climate change here in Minnesota this summer from our hottest June on record in Minnesota to the smoke from the Canadian wildfires that produce unhealthy quality air, air alerts um, for days in July and even here in August for the entire state. To talk about climate change and what is being done in Minnesota to address it, as well as what you can do about it, we're very pleased to have with us Joe Ward and Wally Wade. Wad, thank you for being with us. You're you guys, welcome. and you're kind of, this is your area of expertise, climate change, and that. why don't you tell us a little bit uh, first about, about yourself, well, I'm, about uh, your interest in climate change. Yeah. I'm, I'm Joe Ward. And uh, my wife and I have lived in Woodbury since 1974. I, I was an electrical engineer by training, and I was just sharing with Jody earlier, my, my father taught me all about electric motors, so I thought, why, why shouldn't cars be propelled by electric motors? But, and now they can, but it was the battery, and now they can. But I'm a retired 3M person, and uh, then, then I retired from that and, and started a, a business, and I, now I'm retired from that. <laughs> so I'm a, uh, I, I could only be called a climate advocacy advocate at this point. Um, <clears throat> why? Uh, why I'm interested in climate? Um, my family, um, excuse me. My, f <clears throat> my family and I spent a summer in Los Angeles when I was 16, and the smog left a, a lasting impression. Uh, I remember going up on the Griffith Park, which is a yes. mountain observatory, and looking over the LA basin, and it was just a sea of mud. Uh, and you know, when you went outside, the smog just burned your eyes, and <clears throat> the the climate the the uh, what we had here recently, a week ago, reminded me a lot of oh, that. Oh, so scary. And at the time, we said, why don't they do something? Well, you know, California did something. Uh, they, uh, they introduced uh, uh, regulations on auto emissions, and they cleaned up their, their, uh, they cleaned up their atmosphere. Um, so I want to do something is, is why I'm here. Um, you and know, then, and if, if, like us, you know, you're a person of faith, Whatever your faith, we're taught to take care of our creation. Let's call it environmental stewardship. And we believe it's our responsibility to care for, for this creation that we're part of. And Wally, what about your interest in climate change? Well, I'm um, a retired pharmacist. And uh, I've lived, uh, my wife and I, Jeannie, have lived in Woodbury since uh, 1982. And I was trained at the University of Minnesota to believe in science and facts and evidence. And when um, climate scientists became concerned about increasing uh, warmth of the atmosphere in relationship to uh, the concentration of greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases, I became concerned and decided I needed to do whatever I could to limit the effects of climate change. So what is being done here in Minnesota to address climate change? Well, in a word, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I know it's a complex thing, but what, are, what is being done here? Well, transportation is one of the top four sources of greenhouse gas pollution. A key step forward, we're happy to see, has uh, been this Clean Cars Minnesota initiative that Governor Waltz and the MPCA have just won approval from. Uh, it's a bit controversial, but it, it, it really is the right step. It focuses on ways to electrify transportation. It helps make electric vehicles affordable and available. It basically adopts the environmental standards that California used uh, to eliminate smog there. Uh, another is the eco legislation that was just passed at the end of the session. Uh, it took some important steps towards Governor Waltz's goal to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation by 2040. It allows for incentives to convert from propane or natural gas to electric heating. And this could be a heat pump or geothermal. And Wally, what, what are some of the cities and communities doing to address climate change here in Minnesota? Well, across the country, uh, 180 cities have taken the step to declare that they're going to become uh, climate neutral and uh, get their energy from 100% renewable sources. 
And um, many cities in Minnesota, like uh, Duluth, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Rochester, have uh, developed um, plans to deal with climate change. And um, they may call it a uh, adaptation or a resilience plan or a climate action plan. So um, we would like to see cities in all Minnesota, Minnesota cities develop a plan and uh, deal with that um, to reduce the uh, sources of carbon in the atmosphere. And then what can we as individuals, what are things that I can be doing to address climate change? I mean, well, it seems like, such, again, it's such a complex thing, but we can do actually, something. Actually, it can be quite simple. Okay. Um, reduce or stop burning fossil fuels. Now, that, that sounds hard, but it isn't as hard as it looks. Uh, a valuable resource I found uh, that I've, I've consulted a lot is a, um, agent, is a nonprofit called Rewire America. And if you look at www.rewiringamerica.org, you can find quite a lot of information. They've done detailed modeling of the entire United States economy. Uh, and their data shows that actually since electricity generation is moving from fossil fuel based to renewable, that if we all simply stop burning or stop using um, fossil fuel um, appliances or motors or what have you, and we don't have to throw them away, just when it's time to replace them. If you replace them instead of, uh, with electric, instead of uh, a fossil fuel burner, these, the, the appliances, I mean cars or, or washing machines or so on, uh, last for years, 10 years, 25 years sometimes. So when you buy something new, don't, don't uh, guarantee another 20, 10, 20, 30 years of burning of fossil fuels by buying that, buy instead electric. If you do a new house, if you're building a new house, uh, specify all electric. So. And what about if you have an exist, existing house? I mean, what, are, like, what would be something I could do tomorrow? To well, if your in? furnace gives out, or your air conditioner, you can go to a heat pump. If your water heater uh, fails, you can go to a, a heat pump version of a water heater. It's got a little compressor on top of it, like your refrigerator. Um, clothes dryers, uh, there's actually a heat pump clothes dryer that's available now that will take the air or the, the humidity out of the dryer air and run it down the drain, and you don't even need an exhaust vent. So there are, there are a lot of things you can do. But one of the strongest actions you can take is every decision that you make, uh, choose electric. Well, we just have a couple more minutes. What would be um, some resources or information where people can get, get more information about ways that they can reduce or to address climate change? Yeah, a great resource is Project Drawdown at drawdown.org. And they have listed a whole range of uh, ways to combat, that an individual can combat climate change. And another uh, good way to do that is uh, um, uh, if you are able, you can put solar panels on the roof of your house. Another way is to uh, make changes to your diet, reducing the amount of meat that you eat, uh, eating um, lower on the food chain, plants and vegetables, and uh, and eliminate wasted food. Um, food, um, one of the biggest environmental sources of carbon emissions is agriculture and forestry. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so if you um, are able to uh, eat lower in the food chain, less energy is consumed to uh, eat meat. And um, wasting food is another uh, issue that you can deal with. Um, about a third of all food gets wasted. And anytime you waste food, you also waste the energy that went into producing it and transporting it. So uh, watch carefully what you buy and then what you throw out. Final advice well, for our viewers? Well, uh, we like the saying, think globally, but act locally. We can get involved by asking 
our government officials, city, county, state, as well as federal, to take action. Call your city council person or county commissioner. We can support things like the current federal infrastructure plans. Call your legislator. Uh, we can support Minnesota state actions beyond the Eco Act and Clean Cars. Have lunch with your state representative or join an advocacy group such as MNIPL, Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, is an organization that both Wally and I are on the policy uh, board for, or Minnesota 350, or Isaiah has a strong effort, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, Sierra Club, Climate Generation, and others. Uh, go to Minnesota City websites and see what they're doing. Particularly look at Eden Prairie, Northfield, Maplewood, St. Louis Park, the city of Egan, of course, St. Paul and Minneapolis have both done things. Maplewood has a recent plan that's really excellent that they've put together. Have a look at them. Uh, just concluding, now is the time to take action. Each year we're seeing more severe manifestations of this changing world. And each of us can make a difference. So uh, if you'd like to get involved, try one of these advocacy organizations. Or you can look up Wally and I and <laughs> find us. Uh, my email address, if you're interested, is ward.joe at comcast.net. So please feel free to contact us or one of these advocacy groups. Together, we can do this. Well, it really has been a pleasure to have you both with us today and great information for all of us. So thank great. you. Thanks, thank Wally you and, for and having Joe. Us. Thank you. We really appreciate that. We'll yeah. be back with more right after this. Play Eric Amarola's Race Day Mix. Last August, a 28-year-old Minnesota firefighter took his life. Sadly, he was not alone. As we hear in this next video, more firefighters die by suicide than in the line of duty fighting fires. Firefighters are tasked with helping people that might be dealing with an emergency on the worst day of their lives. And it's something that firefighters are trained to be able to do. But over a career, dealing with people's emergencies day in and day out can take a toll on a firefighter. We need these guys to protect us, to help us. I, I don't know what we would do without them. It's an epidemic that people don't want to address. No one, <laughs> no one wants to admit they've got mental health issues. And I've not wanted to admit it because in our culture it's weak. We have no shortage of people that say, I, that doesn't affect me, it doesn't bother me. And I was one of those guys for a long time. You know, they're out here, they're under a lot of stress. They don't even know the condition of their own homes or their own families. So it's a difficult situation for all of us. Putting not only their lives on the line, but also their emotions. They see some pretty, pretty bad stuff in their careers. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of it has to do with, with children, young adults, uh, and uh, it's often children uh, of the age of their own children, which can be particularly damaging to uh, first responders. And firefighters are no exception. Firefighters, every time they go out, they are walking into somebody else's worst day where we'd be asked to provide life-saving interventions or ultimately pronounce the victim deceased. So from um, jumpers to uh, gunshot 
suicide. That and they are exposed sometimes to pretty grisly and horrific things as well occasionally. And that can sear itself into your memory and leave images and thoughts behind. Kids and, you know, it was the same spot we had done a rescue on the year before, the exact same spot in the bluffs. It's annoying you're going to go into work and put on all your USAR gear and start digging for a dead body it just is a really terrible evening. You see this stuff and you deal with this stuff on a daily basis. The disability gets louder and louder and, you, and you, you can't ignore it and it starts getting louder by causing problems in your personal life. You notice you're not sleeping. You notice you might be drinking a lot more. Find yourself in, in a depression. The incidence of suicidal ideation is about 10 times higher in the EMS provider population than it is in the normal population. I'm concerned about that and uh, trying to do something about it. You know, losing three friends to suicide, knowing their families, knowing what it did to them, knowing what it did to, to me, my crew, and knowing that this is still going on. You can read it every day. I'm worried about the ones that can handle some of the trauma, but ultimately, over years of exposure to that, it weighs on them. They don't have good coping mechanisms. They're not sure what to do, and they feel lost. But they don't want to communicate because they're concerned that's a sign of weakness. So I want to provide avenues for people to go out and seek that help. The reality is that you don't always know what members are dealing with or struggling with. And so I think that alone makes me feel we have to be more proactive in getting out the information and making it acceptable to communicate and talk about our problems before they escalate to that extent. The legislature has taken some really positive steps in the, the presumptive uh, PTSD law. It's pretty much now accepted that the things we do and see are, are just accepted as contributors. Our job is accepted as a contributor to that. In fact, it was gone two minutes ago. <laughs> now it's back. And it's going away. It just, it comes and goes and comes and goes. Don't give up on them. They can, they're going through hell, literally. And uh, you have to, you have to help them find a way through the darkness. We need to take care of them too. They need to be taken care of. To show your support for local first responders, the St. Paul Saints are hosting the second annual Fire versus Police Department Night at the Saints game on Saturday, August 21st at 7 p.m. at the CHS Field in St. Paul. Tickets are available online. Well, that is our program for you. Thanks for joining us on Inside Healthcare. Please stay safe, everyone.